you have some very interesting theories. You believe there is a mystical undertow in life? Quick scenes. Shadows. Give you a little warning. I'm recording you, just so you don't feel like violated. <laughs> we hearing from my lawyers. <laughs> so this is where I want to start because this is what I'm most curious about. How old are you? Uh, 28. 28. So yeah, you're more than 10 years younger than me. Meanwhile, we both kind of have the same main influence, the same favorite band, which is fucking wild to begin with, right? <laughs> and uh, I wore their shirt, you know, for on behalf of both of us. So uh, I know for me, like I, I grew up singing in, you know, choirs and musicals in public school. And um, I had a, my stepdad's father sang in like gospel quartets and he was always touring the world singing like that. And then when karaoke kind of became a big thing, one of my stepdad's brothers got big into karaoke and he would smuggle me into bars and let me, uh, uh, you know, sing in front of all the drunk adults, which was a lot of fun. And when I became a teenager, I got into Bon Jovi, of all things, like, and that was kind of what made me want to be a rock star, it got me kind of like wanting to get up on stage and sing and whatnot. But then, um, then I found Nine Inch Nails, and that kind of changed my entire world, so to speak. And uh, so I'm kind of wondering uh, your own story in that vein, because you've kind of ended up in the same place, despite being an entire fucking generation away, right? So it's pretty interesting. Well, the... Uh... The one reassuring thing I can add is I, I skipped the Bon Jovi stage. <laughs> You're missing out. <laughs> no, I, th it's funny because um, specifically with singing, you know, uh, when I was younger, went to Catholic church. So there was some amount of uh, singing there. But outside of that, to be honest with you, I never really fancied myself uh, a singer. It was sort of out of necessity where in probably late grade eight, early grade nine, had a couple friends who were sort of into the same music. I'd start playing guitar probably, I don't know, when I was maybe 12, something like that. And I was just picking up Adam's Stratocaster and uh, specifically... The, uh, the only reason I ever started playing guitar was because um, my teacher in grade eight, or it might have been grade seven, one of those, uh, had formally taught Adam and had, had a guitar club that they had started at the public school. And so when he was teaching me, he went, well, you know, your brother played guitar. And so I'm sure you do, too. And I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> and by play guitar at that point, I, you know, I mean, I could probably do a very butchered version of Smoke on the Water with one string. He goes, well, you can help me teach it because I want to start one again. And so I sort of went home that day and went, so here's the situation. I, I need to learn how to play guitar well enough to teach it in a week. And so that I, I don't think the guitar club idea ever ended up happening, but it was sort of the catalyst for actually sitting down deciding I should probably try and learn how to play this and uh, that turned into you know at the time the music I was listening to was sort of all the hand-me-downs of my brother and all of his friends so you know I had mix like tape or I guess it wouldn't even be mixed tapes for the most part it was uh, mp3 data discs that you could put into a DVD player and it'd be formatted. So I had folders. And so I remember having ones that were everything from like CCR to napalm death. <laughs> it was just the whole grab bag and, you know, and then all of the necessary industrial stuff from Nin to mushroom head to all that sort of stuff. And uh, so once I started playing guitar and found out that you could just go online and find tabs for songs, I was sort of off the races and wound up getting really into sort of the thrash metal 
kind of music where there was a lot of riffage and it was somewhat technical. And so then by the time I get into, you know, a year or two passes and I'm in grade nine or so, and I got a couple friends who were going to start a band, it was more a matter of necessity of none of the other guys were going to try and sing. And so we didn't have a PA or a microphone or anything like that. I think we had at one point a, uh, a boom box that accepted a eighth inch mic in. So it was, you know, one of the, you, you remember the days of the butchered three different cable connections held together with hopes and dreams all to come out of a tiny little six inch speaker that's supposed to be heard over top of everybody's amps in a drum set. Well, it was definitely that. So I remember the first time we ever played, it was uh, uh, when they were still doing those annual talent shows in uh, Gravenhurst at the Opera House. And our little band went up and we did uh, Seek and Destroy by Metallica and Symphony of Destruction by Megadeth. And I didn't really know if I could sing these songs because I'd never really heard myself over top of the band. But at the same time, it, it never really in a serious way dawned on me that this could sound horrible. <laughs> <It was> a, <laughs> I think uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure because I, I've definitely gotten much more self-conscious about the idea that this could sound horrible. But for some reason, at, at 13 years old, you just go, well, I mean worst case scenario i'll just start sing or stop singing and uh we'll uh we'll play the song faster and with more solos and that would be even better so there's nothing to lose but it wasn't until uh probably a bit further down the line in high school i would say uh i don't know probably when i was 16 or 17 or so a friend of mine who was booking local shows and Aurelia had booked this little band that I had and uh, it was supposed to be our first proper paid show opening for these other local bands that had been in a studio before and they had recorded EPs before so this was serious and we really had to show up and know our shit and uh, the you know the week before the show I'm going well this really isn't coming together and the set list is not sounding very good and so I called the promoter and went listen here's the situation I don't think the band could do it but if you want I don't want to leave you in the lurch so I can show up and do something acoustically just to you know fill the time and so it was sort of a week to throw together an acoustic set but at that point it sort of dawned on me that all right well it's hard getting you know, a bunch of teenagers together and to sort of all focus on doing the same, but doing this acoustic thing, it's sort of either I show up and do the work or I don't, but at least I have control over that. So I sort of made the move into that. And it wasn't really until then that it even dawned on me that maybe I should try and sound halfway as decent when I'm singing. <laughs> so. That's funny. And uh, yeah, I definitely... I haven't actually done it, but I definitely see the appeal of like being able to just kind of get up there with your guitar and do your thing. Cause, um, well, you would know the mind site cause you're, you know, Lenny and Shane, right? So, yeah. um, that band was kind of so talent stacked that like, you know, our drummer was the best guitarist in the band and he just played drums because he could, right? And all of us could kind of be the front man of the band if we wanted to. We all knew how to sing. We all knew how to play instruments. So it was like, I was joking. It was like having four girlfriends and uh, they all hated you all the time, you know, and it was Valentine's Day every day. And um, you, you had to show up, you had to perform, you had to appease them, you had to make them happy. And if you didn't, it was going to be about a three month fight or at least uh, three, three or four days of a cold shoulder. But, uh, you know, the, the appeal of being able to just get up there and do it yourself, you know, it's uh, pretty awesome. And when I see someone like, say, Matt Good get up there and just like completely command a crowd, just him and an acoustic guitar. Like that's, uh, I saw him in a cue to Bala before. And that was what I really took away from it is I'd, I'd love to be able to, to kind of do that. I've always been kind of in bands and always had the backup of other people, but 
uh, so uh, kudos to you to to kind of going that way first because it's not uh, not the easiest way to go. Well, I I can I can appreciate the the benefits of it, especially given the circumstance of how it allowed me to start playing and getting some more experience out there. But it also just uh, sort of definitely made the urge to play with a band all the more noticeable um, because the the biggest problem I had was uh, during those sort of late high school years when I was moving out of playing with a band at the same time I'm going you know any chance I get I want to get on a stage with other people because I I much prefer that and uh, that's definitely still the case where being in Muskoka still it's it's one of those things where trying to to find the group of people that have fairly idiosyncratic tastes of music well that's a little bit difficult and when you start going you know okay well I, I know when I said to you that I'm I want to get a band together you heard a garage rock band I'm thinking smoke machines and I'm going to put together a video screen and <laughs> How do you feel about rolling around in cornstarch before we go on stage? <laughs> Bit of a hard sell, but uh, again, my sort of idealized idea of, of what you would do with a band for live music would be something along the lines of Nine Inch Nails, where there's the visual aspect to it. There's sort of the spectacle, but not in some sort of gauche way of, I'm going to pee on myself while I'm performing. And that's going to be my idea of, uh, of visual wonderment instead. Uh, how do we do something interesting with the medium? How do we incorporate every tool we have available instead of just being the, the guys who show up and play some really loud rock music. And so it's difficult because I think if, if that's what you have in mind for the, the ideal, it, it makes the notion of getting started just completely overwhelming. And, you know, suddenly you're looking at the prospect of starting a band is, well, I better take out a line of credit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I remember the first couple of times I saw Nine Inch Nails that they didn't have that. It was really just kind of them on the stage and uh, the stage was always so black and it was really just the, um, they would trash the stage and trash each other and like trash the crowd. And it was that kind of energy. And I think it was around the fragile where he started to really kind of incorporate yeah. visuals with it even more. And then um, I kind of jokingly, as he lost his voice, that's not nice to say, but, <laughs> but, but, but as he lost his voice, I feel like I kind of started to rely a little bit more on that as well. And it became more and more elaborate. And then, of course, by the, like, say, Beside You in Time tour, he had that, like, whole front drop as well. And they would project on that, plus all the screens behind and a very elaborate light show with lasers and all of that. It was really interesting because in my mind, that's how I see Nine Inch Nails, right? Like, um, when they were just playing on a plain stage. I always had it in my mind, like, no, you guys should have like Pink Floyd like lasers. And, you know, there should be a fucking wall built on that side of the stage that Trent goes and smashes down with his forehead, you know, and <laughs> there, there should be like, you know, dancers on stage and all this stuff. And then when I saw them for the first time, that wasn't there. I was like, oh, OK, well, but it also like because Nine Inch Nails is so production heavy to see them live was really an eye opening thing for me at first, because it was like I remember going to that first concert, like, how do they pull this off? right which is probably something you've bumped into uh, a few times with the music that you produce because you do kind of you know uh, rely on on I shouldn't say rely but you use a lot of um, really kind of deep sound like he does and a lot of interesting like original noise coming out of your guitar that like isn't the traditional thing which you have to then duplicate live somehow right and uh, yeah that's not an easy task well and, and that's Again, it's one of those situations where I sort of I have tentative roadmaps for different songs as to how could we 
try and interpret this live without having to incorporate these 70 layers of synthesizers that are in the original session. But again, that's one of those things where I feel like to try and actually do a good job of presenting any of those songs in a more traditional four or five piece rock band, it, it's not a matter of, you know, get a couple guys together in a room and uh, and bang them out in a couple evenings. So I, it's one of those things where it feels like you sort of have to have a decent group of people together that you can all sit around the computer and uh, and try and make decisions about, all right, well, what's it feasible to have on backing tracks? What, you know, parts can be converted into guitar parts or you know what songs should still have electronics what shouldn't and it's one of those things where i i haven't really had the opportunity to, to sit down with a group of people and have that discussion and that's sort of been the the one bugbear that has sort of been haunting me since getting the first album out is, is going you know i bet these songs could hold up if you strip them down to the uh, the foundation and presented them as more of a rock band type of music, but never had the opportunity to actually hear it in a room and, and see if that would work. And so I think part of the uh, sort of wonderment around the visual element that you see in a production heavy show like Nine Inch Nails is going well I, I don't have a, a drummer and you know another guitarist another bassist for the most part anytime we've done any shows with my original stuff it's been me Adam and then a couple shows we had a friend Ashley playing piano who had never played live before before I went, well, I know you play piano and I know you can sing. So how would you feel about uh, tackling this? And uh, at that rate, it was more, well, we're going to look really silly if we show up with, uh, with nothing else planned. And uh, you've got every other band that's an actual band. We're going to be showing up there. Let's try and at least sort of you know, cast some shadows on the stage and, and make it not so obvious that, you know, oh yeah, there, there are two guitars being played out of the speakers, but only one person on stage playing guitar. And uh, I don't see a drummer, but I'm hearing a lot of drums. So can we present something interesting visually that sort of leverages what we do have and covers up the slight shortcomings <laughs> that... We can't really account for right now, but I'm actually, I'm curious, uh, when were, when was the first time that you saw Nin live? If you were seeing them before, like the fragile. It was like, I was like, I got smuggled into a concert by an older friend who was of age. Um, so I think it was like 14, 15. It was like, it was definitely, I, what would it be further down the spiral had kind of just come out. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and they had played uh, here at Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens on that tour, and um, it's actually one of the first kind of rock bands that I was ever in was a band called Vlad, and it started from that concert because uh, I was still back in the day when, like I said, Nine Inch Nails was still trashing all their instruments. Right. So they would lead, or they and of course Pro Tools wasn't as big in '94 either, right? Like it. Uh, they weren't really running tracks off Pro Tools. They would actually like program their keyboards to have all those sounds in them and then play them naturally, right? So uh, when they trashed everything, they just threw it all out. Right. So we went to like basically the garbage bins and we started picking stuff out, like just kind of for memorabilia. Now we had a friend who worked security for Maple Leaf Gardens, snuck us into the little uh, underground thing the next day. And we, we just kind of had our pick of whatever was trashed and down there. And one of them was a keyboard. And when we took it home and plugged it in, it still worked perfectly. And it had pretty much all the sounds from Pretty Hate Machine. In it. So we kind of just started playing with those sounds and started writing songs on that and did this like, theatrical vampire goth band for you know a year or something like that based on 
this one keyboard. So it was literally like a dude playing drums, a dude playing the keyboard, which was literally just ripping off Nine Inch Nails quite directly. And then uh, the two of us actually singing on it, which was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, the, the next time I didn't get to see them for a long time because they took a long break, right? And then the Fragile came out and uh, they actually played the last concert at Maple Leaf Gardens before Maple Leaf Gardens got, got switched over. And they filmed the uh, And All That Could Have Been DVD. Uh, one of the three shows they filmed was in Toronto. I'm actually on the DVD five minutes and 26 seconds or something into the second disc right after Trent says, I want to fuck you like an animal. They cut to the crowd, pretty much dead center of the crowd is my stupid little face. Um, you see everybody around me jumping, like doing this. And I'm just like, <laughs> staring at the stage. It's, it's actually pretty funny. It was, uh, while I was still living in Gravenhurst, I was working the overnights at uh, the Max up there. Okay. And I uh, can't remember his last name. His first name was John. He worked at Pizza Pizza there for a long time. He was a big Nine Inch Nails fan as well. He had just bought that DVD. And he came in with a computer printout of me and a crowd of people. He's like, yeah, man, this is on the new Nine Inch Nails DVD. I'm like, that's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I know for me, um, the Bon Jovi thing was the performance, right? I really love, like, they're a great live band. I love the idea of, like, I've always loved the idea of performing. Having started with musicals, recording has been kind of a, a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. I, performing has been kind of where I've wanted to be. So when I was watching Bon Jovi, I'm like, here is this larger than life performer. Like he's pretty fucking amazing. And then I think, you know, it wasn't really emotionally in line with me. I had a kind of fucked up life and, uh, you know, I, I guess I needed lyrics with a little bit more of an edge to it. Right. So when I was introduced to Nine Inch Nails, it just went straight into my heart, straight into my soul. It was almost like I wrote all those songs and I just became obsessed. And then, that spiraled into obviously liking things like Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie and, uh, you know, a bunch of other bands around that time. But it was just a very funny change for me to go straight from like Bon Jovi to Nine Inch Nails. Right. Like it was literally like a summer uh, between like grade, grade nine and grade 10 or something like that, or grade eight, grade nine, whatever it was, where it was like, one year you see me, I've got these like dress shirts on, tight jeans, I've got like my my hair all done nicely. And then the next year I come in, I'm all dressed in black and gray, and not really talking to anybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, there's a definite like kind of emotional quality to Nine Inch Nails that I just, you know, fell in love with. And even to this day, I can't get away from that. Like I need, the music I listen to has to be able to engage me on that level. And that all comes from kind of listening to Nine Inch Nails. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too, because thinking back like sort of the earliest exposure to actually actively going out and, and listening to my listening to music that sort of spoke to me in any way the most obvious examples i can think of are sort of rating those old mp3 discs and that would have been at about i want to say as early as you know like nine ten years old maybe a little younger still just because it it, it was around me because you know I, I was always sort of the the third wheel to adam and any of his friends and so i can't really think of a, a clear delineation as to before i was listening to things along the lines of nine inch nails and it would have been you know a I'm guessing, I think it was probably around 2001 that uh, all that could have been came out somewhere around there. And I think Adam bought that shortly after it came out because there was a decent chunk of time of us only having that before 2005, 2006, whenever Beside You in Time would have come out. But I remember sort of that being the first exposure both recorded or anything to this is what live music looks like and so there wasn't really any other reference point and so it, it, you know once you know, you're a little bit older you know into 12 13 years old and I, I can't even remember what it would have been before YouTube for video but it, when you could actually sit down on a computer and pull up live concert footage and you're going 
well, this is all pretty underwhelming because my reference point is, uh, you know, all you fucking pigs march. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not doing that here. And so it, it's funny because I think one, just the the idea of a performing band, there was always some amount of theatricality to it and the sort of larger than life element but when i thought of a performer i I never really had anyone before a trent reznor or something like that as sort of the idea of the person on stage with the microphone i just assumed that surely you were going to look tortured and you're going to be hitting yourself with a microphone (laughs) because Uh, on beat of course exactly and i think too with the with the music it's funny because like i said i sort of got into more traditional metal stuff more as a function of playing guitar and it sort of gave me things to learn and but even then throughout all of that it was sort of obvious that nine inch nails was what i actually wanted and i think that was largely a function of one the just the density of the music where listening to it you know you you were finding something new every time you sat down with headphones on but more than that i think like i tried to to quantify this before in terms of what makes any given song interesting and it's I don't think it's necessarily the emotional content to me that's certainly like a prerequisite for something to to really grab me but at the same time I think the biggest thing is one all the Nine Inch Nails stuff was just well written just on the level of songwriting, it was all strong. But more than that, I think it was the textural element to it where the actual sounds that are being used, there, there's an interesting quality to them. There's a texture, there's a timbre to them that actually stood out is interesting. And so in the same way where, you know, I can, name off uh you know plenty of sort of boring overly polished pop records that i like and actively listen to because all right the songwriting's great on these these are damn catchy and well-arranged songs and then you throw in you start you know suddenly you you find something that's damn catchy and well-written songs with some more interesting choices in instrumentation and and texture and suddenly it's funny it feels like it's sort of bridging that gap into suddenly you can find the swedish pop band that is just doing really interesting synthesis and that has a unique quality to it and i'm going you know what i'm liking this for the exact same reason i like nine inch nails in that there's just at the end of the day there's just something interesting about it that makes it compelling more so than the emotional content per se and there's certainly you know instances where you know the the last 10 percent that sort of pushes a lot of nine inch nails stuff over and above the rest is that emotional quality that I can connect to. Um, like, you know, something like leaving hope off of like the still EP, I'm going, well, that has all the boxes of being well written and having a lot of interesting instrumentation and texture to it. And it has an emotional gut punch to it. And it didn't need lyrics or vocals to do that. But I think the the biggest thing was more just the sort of 
quality of the the writing and stuff like that like like nine snails and then the fact that instrumentally it, it was doing something interesting and that's i think what sort of grabbed me as soon as i started putting together a little studio and trying to write stuff was more so than anything else let's try and aim for that bullseye of whether or not you like it at least being able to sit down and go well you did something interesting there yeah and uh you mentioned the density of nine inch nails which is one of my favorite parts of it as well and um the way you described it is exactly the same way i would describe it to someone who didn't know nine inch nails like literally every time you sit down to listen to it you're probably going to hear something new he does these weird things where there's like this sound up here and then the sound down here and then on the next verse they switch <laughs> and like you can notice little things like that and especially with the fragile where he like really, really, really layered it up. And then everything obviously preceding that or proceeding that is um, it has that multiple layer density to it that to be honest for a long time, because I, I listened to it so much, other music sounded empty to me. It was yeah. like, you know, you could be doing so much more here, but you're not. Um, I did eventually hit a point where I kind of went the opposite way where I was like, okay, now I'm into a lot of just straight acoustic song or just a, a trick at a piano or something like that. But every time Nine Inch Nails comes on, it's like an instant reminder. Oh, this is my jam. <laughs> like this is, you know, that, that feeling like I always called it a wall of sound. Like mm -hmm. it was just like, you're walking into this massive wall of sound. And then just on a personal level, you know, I can identify with his lyrics. I can identify with his personality. I think we're kind of very similar in a lot of ways. So the lyrics really, really speak to me in that sense. And then, yeah, like you could play a regular bar chord on a guitar with distortion, or you can run it through this filter, that filter, this filter, and then circuit it back through this old recorder and then pump that into Pro Tools and affect it one more time. And that's my guitar sound, you know? And um, well, as a songwriter, that really fascinated me. The interesting thing too, using that example still staying on Nin, was, was it was the intentionality behind it. It was because yeah, you know you can give me the Billy Joel album where people are going, well, you know, uh, there's so many little details. He plays that piano riff at the end of the chorus a little differently every time, and okay, that's nice, but especially when you, I remember when uh, year zero, all the multi-tracks were released for it. So you could put them up in like a garage band session and actually listen through things soloed. And you realize that, okay, even for a song where it, it wasn't necessarily um, trying to be especially bombastic, it wasn't, you know, the the wall of sound being these giant guitars and distortion and instead it was more subdued electronics you start listening to individual tracks and going there there's so much variation within what any other artist would be uh, where they would just be using a static synthesizer sound or you know the the sort of bog standard midi to the grid and it cycles through the sound every four bars and, and that's the part. Instead, you're hearing so many little tiny variations and uh, glitches and distortions and things like that. And, and then you start going back and listening to the older stuff that preceded that and realizing, oh, he's been doing this the entire time. And there's a whole other layer of, of ear candy that I haven't been noticing. And especially once I started trying to record and produce my own stuff and realizing how much effort that can take and realizing, you know, how so much of that is more felt than heard where you can put the hour into adding interesting little textures and, and things like that to a, to a part that nobody's ever going to hear unless they heard it soloed, but it does feel different. Yep. There is something interesting about that. And I don't know, it, it, it's something that, again, just 
made me appreciate beyond sort of good songwriting or or uh, sort of emotionally resonant lyrics, just this other element wherein you were, it almost it feels like respecting the listener enough to go, you might not hear this, but I think it's worth both of, you know, if you're going to sit down and listen to this song, it's worth me having put in the extra time to, to add in these details that you might not actually hear, but one, you'll be rewarded for if you do listen 20 times. And beyond that, there's a certain, whether it's real or not, uh, sort of perceived sense of sophistication in the, in the production that jumps out to me that Okay, if you want to hear something interesting that might challenge you, let me give you something that has this attention and care put to it. Makes sense. What's your kind of typical, I mean, I, I know firsthand that we, we don't write all songs the same way, but uh, most of us kind of have a kind of standard of where we start, kind of a, a basic skeleton of, of what we do when we're writing a song. So what's yours? Uh, well, I can tell you one thing. Lyrics are the absolute last thing that will ever happen uh, because they're terrifying and they're never good. They're always bad. And you, if ever there's an example of something where you just have to go like, well, th this feels the least amount embarrassing. <laughs> All done. So that's what we're going to go with. Usually I, uh, it tends to be Again, something, you know, uh, stumbling onto a sound or a loop or a synth patch or something that just has an interesting quality to it. It's, you know, I can think of damn near, I would say probably easily 75% of the, the songs that I've finished were a function of the interesting three second sound that just struck me as okay there there's a texture here there's a, a quality here that is compelling for some reason and then it's just slowly building up a sort of skeleton around it and fleshing things out i i would love to be able to to sit down and and sort of play four chords on a piano and build up a song from there but aside from very rare instances where that's the starting foundation of a song, I would say it's almost always a matter of finding the interesting little loop, the interesting little sound, and just building layers onto it. And slowly that turns into a rough arrangement and trying to build some cohesive structure to it and then as you're going through suddenly you're getting little ideas for vocals where you know uh, again it's never sitting down with a, a page of lyrics going I need, I need to write music to to fit this song I've put together lyrically instead it's well I think I have what is a verse and a chorus and maybe a bridge in sort of rough musical form. And whenever I get to what I think is the chorus, I have a little melody that's going off in my head. And that melody might come with a couple words, it might not, but basically over the process of, all right, now I'm going to try and flesh out the song in more detail and, and figure out the little dynamics behind it, the little, uh, accents and details just more and more of the vocal structure starts coming to you where now you might have just heard the melody in your head for the chorus so many times with a certain set of syllables that you're you know you've attached a couple words to it and you're going well I guess I need to write lyrics that make sense with those words because I'm never going to get them out of my head and <laughs> but, <laughs> but 
usually I would say it's uh, a song is easily 80 90 percent finished musically before I'm ever sitting down with a piece of paper to try and write lyrics and at that point usually I have the melodies completely sketched out sort of all the 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 rhythmic structure of what the vocals should be doing and it's more a matter of well I need a three syllable word here and I need a one syllable word here with a hard consonant so that way you're really coming on that downbeat and the difficulty there is uh, I definitely noticed that the the first album I did because it was sort of the writing process of it was stretched out probably over three or four years because I was learning how to write and produce and mix. So all the songs just sort of kept going further down the rabbit hole of, well, I'm, you mean you can add orchestra to song? <laughs> well, I think every song should have an orchestra in it at some point or other, because why wouldn't you? And also uh, definitely having a certain insecurity with regards to to singing then going well can i leverage that in a way of going you know leaning into that and trying to have rather dense vocal production uh if i don't like the way my voice sounds when it's just one voice straight between the speakers all by its lonesome well is there a way of adding a lot of vocal production in a way that still feels interesting and and in a way that feels unusual for this type of music you know if you're writing sort of alternative rock with a lot of electronic stuff well i can't think of too many instances you know that also has a lot of dense vocals so the closest thing i can think of is bjork or something like that and so because of that with that with the the first album uh i did that was definitely a a situation where the vocals were really being left to the last minute and you you would have you know the, the part where there's 20 vocal tracks oh fuck i recorded that a year ago that was no problem but the verse where there's only one vocal. Oh, well, maybe I should wait until I get the new mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do you do it all, all on your own? Pardon me? Are you writing all on your own or is your uh, brother with you on that or is it just you? Uh, it, it's just me. There's been a, a couple songs where I've had him come and, uh, and, you know, either it's handing him a guitar and saying, you figure out a couple layers for this part because I, you know, I need someone else to just have their input there or uh, I need another voice in this part. So come and sing these parts for me. But at the same time, he's the main person that I'm bouncing off the ideas off of. So while I'm writing everything, I'm generally speaking, you know, anytime there's a song that has received any noticeable amount of work on it, He's the first person I'm giving a copy to and going, what do you think? Is this moving in the right direction? And, and there have been, you know, plenty of times where he goes, I don't like what you've done. I think it's in the wrong direction. And I go, well, you're wrong and I'm going to prove it to you. <laughs> Give me a tonight. And I would say it's sort of 50, 50% of the time where, I take another couple days to work on it and I meekly walk back to him and go, yeah, you were probably right. It probably didn't need a flugelhorn. <laughs> Every song needs a flugelhorn, man. Every song. <laughs> <laughs> and there are other times where, you know, same thing where I, I'm telling him, trust me, it's not quite right yet, but I know what I'm doing and this is going to work if, if you give me another day or two at it. Um, but the, the, the writing process, it's funny because I, the, the album I'm working on right now is sort of like a, I'd say a 50, 50 split of songs that 
weren't quite finished or or didn't quite feel right for the first album and then the other half of it is completely new stuff that has sort of been written in the past two years let's say and there's definitely a pretty stark contrast just in terms of uh not quite having the kitchen sink thrown at it in the same way Uh, i think some of that is getting a little more comfortable with the idea of okay i i don't need to have 20 things happening at one time to cover up the vocal performance (laughs) and also the the excitement and novelty of being able to add layer upon layer and sort of emulate artists like Trent Reznor who can do that well well I don't know if my attempts to do that have always been a complete bullseye uh, complete success so feeling more comfortable stepping back from that and going well let's try and make this work with with less moving parts and let's try and take the Rick Rubin approach of mute the the seven completely redundant things that are happening in the background that, well, they're there, but I don't know if they quite meet the, uh, the threshold of actually improving things. To try and focus on just the one thing that kind of drives it, it can be difficult, especially, uh, I know my approach to, to music is, pro- is similar to what you're describing. I hear layers and I hear, you know, piles on top of piles on top of piles whether it's vocals and that was a big problem when I started writing for bands is like I was trying to write as if I was five or six different people and there's just no way I can sing all those parts at the same time but in my head I can hear them right so so why not it's uh it it should be achievable but it's really not a lot of people think that you know I think hip-hop kind of skewed people's opinions on on how difficult it actually is to use things like loops and and use things like samples everyone thinks it's like you know just take it out of the box drop it on the track and you're good to go but it's really not that easy and then trying to find and you deal with this with mixing trying to find the sonic pockets right like this this sits really well with this and this sits really well with this and that conflicts really strong with that so i have to change that sound somehow it's um you know, when I was going into writing music like Nine Inch Nails, I never really thought of any of that stuff. I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll just keep piling layers on until it sounds good. But then you realize that the layers start conflicting with each other. And the more you pile on, it actually starts to sound worse, not better. Right. So being able to find that happy medium of adding new uh, elements to it without even taking away maybe from from the first element. Right. Like you'll hear, like, say you got a piano track and you really like the piano melody. And then you start adding layers and all of a sudden, fuck, I can't even hear my piano melody anymore because I've just added, added all these other layers. But it is also a lot of fun because you kind of get to like visualize music as opposed to just hearing it. You can kind of, um, I don't know if this is the way your brain works too, but like I can kind of see the pocket that the vocal should sit in. I can kind of see the pocket that the bass and drum need to go into. And um, it's almost like the, the idea of like being able to see sound as color there, there's like a visual element that comes along with it. Personally, that's kind of where I write lyrics from. Um, the band you're probably most familiar with, maybe Unraveling, that I do with Shane. Shane writes all those songs and he gives them to me and they're kind of complete. He's usually titled them, which influences me a little bit. But what I'm listening to is like what the song is making me feel, what kind of emotions are coming up, what it's making, where my mind's going. And then I, I write the lyrics that way based on that. Uh, is that kind of how you go about yours as well? I would I would say there's definitely some overlap there where uh, there's the fun game of, you know, six months after a song's finished, going back, listening to it and going, well, I guess it's time for me to figure out what the hell I was singing about. Because during the, the writing, that, that's not always clear. And usually, again, it's similar to what you're saying of of there being some sort of I don't know if it's necessarily subconscious emotion or 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 mood that you're you're trying to create but because sometimes it's relatively explicit you know Uh, sometimes you're going like well this is an angry song 
but at the same time it, it's something where the music is always informing that and the lyrics are really more to i think for me convey more of the emotional character of the music rather than to necessarily say something all that concrete or literal and it's interesting because at the same time uh, i don't think there have been too many songs i've written where you know you're going the Maynard James Keenan route of, uh, you know, early Tool having its moments of just being completely abstract and the meaning there, you know, could fill a hundred pages of a forum somewhere. Yeah. I, when I'm actually looking at the lyrics in hindsight, I'm going, well, you know, the, these could be read fairly literally. There, There's not too much pretense of extremely deep themes and and hiding the ball in that sense but when it comes to actually writing the lyrics themselves yeah you know, there's not really you know well my girlfriend broke up with me and it's really pissing me off so i'm going to write a song about that bitch instead it's six months down the line going wow i was really still feeling that breakup apparently because I think that's what was going on there. So you find it's more of a subconscious thing for you than a conscious thing, I guess. Yeah. Kind of... Yeah. And uh, again, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, like I said, the the angry song musically is is going to inform the the lyrics to to some degree, but at the same time, I, I think usually it's more hearing the song, hearing the emotion of the song and going, well, what is this an opportunity to sort of tap into? Even if as the, you know, from the first person view, the person who's sitting down with the pen and paper, you're, you're not explicitly going, well, this is an angry song. So maybe I should address those childhood traumas that have really been eating away at me. Instead, I think it's more just opening yourself up to and I, I don't even know if I want to say, you know, a sort of expressing that on a subconscious level, but it's, uh, yeah, it's hard for me to say exactly what's, what's driving the, the writing of the lyrics in that regard. Cause I, I, I don't know if looking back it, there's a sense of catharsis or anything like that. I don't think even if there are songs where I can clearly tell after having them been written that, okay, uh, I was probably influenced by X thing that was happening in my life at the time. I don't know if the act of writing the lyrics and sort of putting them to song has the emotional release that a lot of people say it does mm -hmm. I, I instead I, I i think it's more just sort of conveying some emotion in a more abstract way of you know well let's tap into some sort of aggression or some sort of angst or some sort of lust and even if I can look back and go, well, here's what was influencing me at the time. I feel like, well, I'm, like, I'm, I'm just finishing up writing lyrics for the album that I'm doing right now. And I feel like I'm certainly tapping into the same things that I was writing about three, four years ago. And not... Yeah, like that well hasn't been tapped. I, I, I certainly didn't drain all the water out of the angst well. Let's put it that way. So if songs, writing these songs is supposed to uh, 
scratch that itch. It's not working so far. <laughs> well, maybe one day. I mean, uh, obviously it's development for all of us as songwriters, right? And I think we kind of tap into what we need to. It sounds like, um, I think of Dave Grohl often because he's he's talked a lot about how he does the same thing. Like his lyrics are literally like the last thing he even thinks about. Um, he's just thinking about the melodies, right? He's got the melodies that he's kind of got in his head. And once he's in the studio, he kind of like goes in and more or less ad lib stuff and then writes it down as he goes, right? And so it doesn't really have a lot of like linear deep meaning to it. You could like read any given line and pick a meaning out of it. But a lot of the times over the course of his songs, they wouldn't have that. But he's he's gone back and forth on that as well. He's done the other approach where he's like, I'm basically going to write the lyrics first and then do it that way. And you do end up with two completely different outcomes a lot of the time. And I think that there's definitely a place for both. I I tend to lead to like my, like vocals are my primary love and, and, and I really love storytelling. And uh, the kind of medium of music has been a, a method of storytelling for me. So when I sit down to write lyrics, it's almost like melodies come second right. and lyrics come first. Whereas it's uh, like, say, when I write with Lenny, I notice he kind of does a little bit something similar to what you're saying, where he kind of, you know, where his syllables are placed and where the melodies fall and everything, he's already got it in mind and how it, it fits into that. I have to kind of reverse engineer that, where I have to then like take this pile of words I've got in front of me and somehow make it fit with the music, which is similar to part of the reason why they call me Shaynard is because it's kind of like Maynard in that regard. It's like, he kind of just has his poetry and then he sits down and he's like trying to fit poetry into the songs. There are some mindset songs and some unraveling songs where I've like literally pulled out a notebook I wrote when I was 13 that had just poetry in it. And I've learned how to sing that poetry to it. So it's interesting for me to hear other songwriters, uh, you know, process on that because I, I can't say that one's better than another, right? I think that like some people are really good at like just kind of pulling it out of their, pulling it out of the ether like that as they go. Whereas I know like someone like Trent as well, he he pulls it all out of journals and, and whatnot, right? And, and then fits it into the music. So interesting to, to hear. Um, I have a hard, I, I kind of wish I could do the opposite a little bit better at times where I could just kind of focus on the emphasis. Well, I'm curious. Because the main thing I think that's always struck me is the roadblock to, to attempting the sit down at, with the diary and wrestle with real raw emotion is a certain insecurity and, and vulnerability that would come with that. And oh, I think the biggest hesitation there would be whenever I hear lyrics that strike me as too literal, that wear their heart on their sleeve a little too much, 99% of the time I, I find that um, just, uh, I don't know if it's a function of not being able to relate to the lyrics, not being able to place myself in them because the lyricist has made them so personal and and so idiosyncratic to themselves but i find it difficult to to personally relate to lyrics that are, are written that way at least when they're explicitly done so and it's funny that you you know again using the the Trent Reznor reference the the interesting thing there is I think he skirts that line for me where there are times where I'm listening to the lyrics and going like if this was sung by anybody else I wouldn't like it and it's only because there's an emotional conviction behind it that I can actually listen to these and feel like I'm represented in them in some way but for me personally, in terms of writing, I, I I think I've always been just mortified the idea of trying to write that way. Because one, there's a certain amount of vulnerability that just never felt comfortable doing. 
but also not feeling confident that I could skirt that line and do it in such a way where one, there was the emotional conviction behind the words that sold you on the story. And two, worried that any attempt at doing that would be too literal, would be too one dimensional. And, you know, there's only so many ways that you can interpret the line, uh, I walked down the street. Yeah. And some lyricists and some vocalists can can really sell that and they can really make that work. But I know any time I've tried to write like that, I look at the page afterwards and I'm just sort of mortified with myself and going and, and again, and I just don't know if if that's a function of a certain insecurity of letting the, the listener in this, you know, sounds terribly self-important and <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i don't know if it's that or just a a function of that sort of lyricism being so hit and miss for myself but uh, so i'm curious for you do you find the same thing where one there's the the hesitation of, of letting people uh hear lyrics of yours that can be read in a very literal way if they wanted to but also like would you find that when you're writing lyrics there's a fairly large ratio of it where you're just going like well nope that that uh that didn't come out quite the way i wanted to and that's a little too literal a little too one-dimensional and yeah, I definitely try to stay away from that. One, my favorite thing to do is like write a song about one thing, like have it have one meaning to me personally, but also word it in such a way that people can take it their own way. Um, a good example of that is there's a song at the end of the first Mindset record called Reinfected. It happens to be most of the female fans' favorite song because they think it's a love song. Mm -hmm. I'm actually singing about doing cocaine. Right, <laughs> like as an example, depending so, on the listener, is a love song. So, well, there you go. Right, it's uh, the and that's what uh, I like to do is I like to take a theme that can be kind of looked at from two different directions and almost mean two different things. Like I've done that with um, I wrote a song one time that was more or less kind of sung from the Earth's perspective as we're polluting her and destroying her and everything else. Almost her singing to us like fuck you if you don't stop this there's going to be trouble but when most people hear it they again think it's that relationship between a man and a woman or even like two two brothers or something like that where they're having that that kind of thing so i really like that idea where it's it's kind of open to your interpretation um i want it to have a very linear kind of story um at the same time but a story that could be kind of like a choose your own adventure it can you can apply your own meaning to the lyrics, um, that's a hard line to walk. You can, you know, it's 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 kind of a hit and miss. Um, thankfully, I'm, I've kind of got a talent for it and I've worked like I've honed that as a craft. I do it when I'm writing stories. I do it when I'm writing poetry, pretty much everything that I do. I kind of like to be able to keep it, uh, I guess the word is ambiguous a little bit for people to add their own interpretation. Um, mostly because I like music like that and you know, I, I think that that adds to listenability. Like um, I can even think of some Nine Inch Nails songs that I would listen to when I was like, say, 16, that had like a very solid uh, relation point to me, like a very solid meaning to me. They meant this to me because I went through this situation. And then like 10 years later, I listened to it again. And I'm like, oh, that actually also applies to this situation. And all of those concepts and ideas fit this line of thinking even though it's a completely different scenario completely different set of people maybe even a completely different emotion at the end of it right. so you're right in trent being able to do that like he uh you might you could like just kind of read his lyrics and say they seem pretty simple mm -hmm. but it's his voice that sells them right yeah. and uh it's the same thing uh, when Lenny and I first met, we used to talk about this a lot. Pretty much everybody can learn how to sing. There are people out there who have, call it a God-given ability or some type of natural talent that makes them more compelling to listen to than other singers, right? And that's uh, a lot of that does come through will and conviction in the voice. Like a, like someone I don't even really like, like Adele, 
you can't listen to her and not go fuck she means every word that's coming out of her mouth right like you can you can feel it when she says it and i think to me anyways that's what i look for in vocalists is i have to have that quality in their voice and trent had a ton of it and it reminds me of um I think I was around 20 at the time um, trying to write some music and I was at a party and I was talking to this girl about uh, being a musician and she's like, oh, well, uh, like, who do you sing like? Who do you sound like? I'm like, oh, like Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. And she's like, oh, so you can't sing, but you've got a cool voice. (laughs) Right. And she's not wrong because like, I mean, he can sing, but he doesn't have like the range of even Maynard or like, you know, some other some other. Uh, more traditional type of singer but he's got a really interesting voice with a a very deep emotional quality to it that just sells it and when I was talking about him losing his voice that's actually what I feel like he's lost the most is that it's almost like it doesn't have that quality that draws me into just the voice now my attachment to him is the fact that I've been listening to him my whole life and it doesn't matter what he does I'm gonna listen to it again right but um I really noticed it because he just did Halsey's new record yeah I don't know if you've listened to that but like that's the best Nine Inch Nails record I've heard in a long time and it's because she sells it like her her story her lyrics the her voice she's got that quality to her voice and then it's like you know the fragile behind her you know something like it sounds very similar to something like what he was writing around the fragile time and yeah i mean i i don't like halsey i don't listen to the rest of her music but i fucking love that record because it's got both of those qualities Mm -hmm. no i thought that record was fantastic and that's i think there was uh i listened to her first album when it came out and it had a couple songs on it where, you know, again, the, I didn't feel like there was any deep emotional core behind it. But I, you know, I enjoy and appreciate good pop music. So there were a couple songs on there where I enjoyed the production and she did a perfectly good vocal performance on it. And I went, this is cool. All right. But beyond that, didn't really pay any attention to her. And then when I heard that they were going to be doing the production for her next album, I went like, that could work. And I thought that it was fantastic. For, you know, yeah, I love it too. I have like pretty much since I, since I found out about it, it was kind of an odd thing because I heard uh, she did a song on the Birds of Prey soundtrack called Experiment on Me. And I loved that song. She screams at the end of it, it's badass. And then um, I listened to some of her other tracks and I'm like, meh, whatever. And then probably just because of the algorithm of YouTube, having looked at some of her videos, I woke up one morning and had to sign into YouTube for something else. And I popped this interview with her, Trent Naticus, and I'm like, the fuck? <laughs> so I had to listen to that, found out that heard the story about the record, which is a beautiful story, by the way, like mm-hmm. mad props to her for taking that risk and, and doing such a good job of it. But uh, yeah, and then, you know, and that's the first album that's inspired me for a long time, right? a long time. So. It's funny too. You you just made me think of it. Uh, talking about uh, using Adele as an example, but I think part of it for me as even a listener, uh, I would say, generally speaking, unless your lyrics are very good or very bad, I don't really notice them as a passive or even active listener. Uh, I, you know they're sort of the the window dressing to whatever melody you're singing but I, I i really tend to hear the the voice more as just a another rhythmic melodic instrument in the song and it's generally speaking not unless the lyrics are to my ear so jarringly bad that it pulls me out of the experience or so good that suddenly I'm going, wow, I, I, I'm actually invested in what's being sung here beyond just the, the emotional context of the, the performance itself. And so it's funny what becomes popular because have you ever looked at the lyrics for uh, uh, sunglasses at night? I don't think I have. The lyrics make no fucking sense, like none at all. 
He's, he says, like, don't switch the blade for the guy in the shades. Oh, no. Don't masquerade with the guy in the shades. Like, there's no point to any of those lyrics. He, like, even Nirvana is a, an example of this. Like, I'm, like, listening to Nirvana, and it's, like, some pretty lines and some some cool plays on words, but they mean nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like, but well, at I the same time, you don't notice. That at yeah. times. I have to remind my, because I, I have that moment, too, every so often, specifically when you're listening to to commercially popular songs that you know clearly a lot of people enjoy this and uh ostensibly they they feel some emotional attachment to this music you know they went and got the lyrics tattooed on their arm but you're when you read them you're going i don't think that means anything right yeah so there's definitely every so often when you can sort of pull your own head out of your ass it's a worthwhile perspective to take of uh there are plenty of great songs that people purport to, to love the lyrics to that when you actually read them. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's funny how like wrong people have lyrics a lot of the time too. I find it's like people like constantly sing songs and they think they know the words, but they really don't. <laughs> it's uh, that's kind of funny too. It's like, there's so many different, and this is why, like, I remember when I was young, I used to like, you know, get in arguments about like, this band is better than this band and this music sucks and this artist sucks and this one's great and all of that stuff. And as I started to get older, I started to realize that it all just comes down to personal taste, right? Like you and I are even like exhibiting two completely different tastes in vocals, like the lyrics, the melody, like that's, that's, that's my jam. That's what I need the most. And for you, it's kind of like a, unless it's bad you barely notice it right and but meanwhile we both still love exactly the same band so it, it just goes to show you that there is no real right and wrong it is kind of personal taste opinion and uh i mean you could say technically x drummer is better than y drummer or x guitar guitarist better but i mean slash makes that shit sing even if you can't shred like you know mars uh, not fucking so, so like saviandi or something like that right like he, he still has a quality that makes it just beautiful, regardless of the fact that maybe he's not technically as good as the other person. You hear it a lot with drummers. It's like, Neil Peart's the best drummer. Danny Carey's the best drummer. No, it's the guy from Dream Theater. No, it's that guy, right? And yeah. I think it is. Uh, personal taste is just so caught up in it that, uh, you know, that, that type of arguing amongst ourselves is kind of pointless. It's very easy to say. I don't like Nickelback. I think it's lame. But at the same time, if someone took me to a Nickelback concert, I would have a great time because they're amazing live, right? So there's there's qualities to all of it that can be appreciated. And yeah, it's uh, not not everybody likes the same flavor of ice cream. So we're we're really lucky that there's so many different flavors out there. Like when I hear "Toxic" by Britney Spears, I don't listen to Britney Spears. That fucking song is amazing, right? So and, and everyone can do it. And. It's funny because I, I, when things first locked down uh, back in early 2020, I uh, had sort of decided, all right, well, I got some extra time on my hands because I was, I was laid off from work for maybe three months or so. And uh, I went, well, you know what? One thing that might be worth doing since prior to that I, I was playing usually you know two or three nights uh on the weekend at a local restaurant just doing a acoustic sets and between doing that and then most of the music i was writing having more of a synth heavy element where there was guitars galore but it was all very uh, simple and uh, never the sort of main focus I went well it might be interesting to sit down and, and try and record some more metal stuff just because that's where I learned to play guitar and I still have fun doing that sort of thing and so it sort of wound up turning into a what was originally going to be it'll be an excuse for me to play a little more guitar turned into, well, now I've got a song and now I've got two songs and well, they don't sound half bad. And I uh, had a buddy of mine who was a vocalist for uh, a local band and they weren't playing together anymore. And he'd heard them and he went, Hey, you know, I think this is really cool what you're doing. And if you ever want to 
try and lay some vocals down on this. I'm, I'm game. And so it sort of sent me back to going through some of the older metal stuff that I listened to all through, you know, like the early 2000s, uh, like metal core stuff. And just because I, I was sort of curious as I was playing more of this music going like, well, I wonder if this stuff stands up still, if it, because I remember it was very compelling to me when I was 16. And it's funny because some of it, I would say, yeah, it still really does. And others of it, I'm listening to it going, this, this really doesn't strike me as particularly well written. You know, I, and I think part of that is because, you know, if you had asked me at 16 when I was listening to the mu this music, you gave me something like, toxic by britney spears i don't know if i would have been nearly as open-minded to that at the time as i am now where I, I listen to that and i go well that's a mastercraft in, in songwriting that's fantastic and you know even if it's a little saccharine and you know it, it might not have that deep emotional resonance that you're looking for in in the absolute favorites of your music taste you can't deny a well-written song and uh so it's been interesting going back through some of the older metal stuff where the songwriting at the core of it was pretty hit or miss i would say you know it's pretty hard to write a eight minute song that has 20 different sections and do it well and sometimes they did but more often than not, I, I listen to it now and go, wow, I, I, <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of sections that could have been cut. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or like one of those things Tool likes to do where there's just this long circle jerk of them riffing in the middle of it. It's like, you guys didn't really need to go there, but I get it. <laughs> Whatever. What do you think of their newest album, by the way? <sighs> well, I mean, it is the linear evolution of the band and when i say the band i actually mean like the three instrument players it's the linear s like and it was funny maybe this was kind of front loaded because i saw maynard on joe rogan's podcast before the record and he kind of insinuated he kind of just showed up for it um and it, not in so many words was kind of saying like you know i showed up and i heard what they were doing and i'm like okay but where do i sing yeah right and so when i'm listening to it it, it does feel like it's missing maynard in a way um, but at the same time, you know, where the band has ended up, like they are so tight now, they are so precise now that it's like, you can't help but appreciate it for what it is in that term. Definitely not my favorite of their albums. It's probably like pretty down the line in that. Like I, I think of like lateralist and enema are kind of like equal to me. And then I would, I would actually backtrack and say undertow before 10,000 days. And then I would put um the newest album even behind all of that so um it's kind of where i'm at with it uh the first few listens i think i was a little bit taken up in the fact that i hadn't heard any new tool for 13 fucking years and it was like the excitement of it uh, mixed with the nostalgia of it and the kind of rebirth rebirth but then i realized that like when did that come out three years ago in august i think it was I think I listened to it for like two months and I haven't listened to it since. Right. But like I listened to all of Lateralist two days ago. Right. So um, that, that's kind of it with them. I'm, I like it. I get it. But it is really just a self-indulgent Tool album. Yeah. And I, I was never a huge Tool fan. Uh, I sort of. Even when I was first starting to listen to music, you know, uh, I, I know there was one of those discs that I had when I was, you know, 10 years old or whatever, that would have had some of the earlier stuff on it. it you know, I remember it would have had schism, it would have had hooker with a penis, that sort of thing. And I thought, you know, all right, well, this is cool. But then whenever I'd sat down and listened to a full two album, never really hearing anything that engaged me to want to actually sit down, actively listen to it from front to back. 
but take something like Merit and Oms by A Perfect Circle. That I was just going to ask about A Perfect Circle. Yeah, it would probably be more up your alley. Records of all time. Like I, you know, I thought that that was pure gold. And I mean, like I, I listened to that new tool album once, I think. And I can't remember if I made it all the way through it before I went, eh, this isn't for me. Yeah. And I think I listened through the new Perfect Circle album once or twice before going, so nothing's really grabbing me. Go back to that one, man. Yeah. I don't know if you smoke weed, you smoke a joint, put headphones on, lay in the dark and listen to that album again. If, if you think of it like a concept album, it's great. If you're trying to find like individual songs, there's nothing there. But yeah. if you let the whole thing play out and just like take it in as a concept album, kind of like a, a Pink Floyd, The Wall, or even The Fragile, something like that, where they clearly have a theme to it, it's, it's clearly a story. That's what makes it great. But otherwise, I feel the same. My Perfect Circle story, you might actually appreciate because it was that uh, for the year 2000 concert at Maple Leaf Gardens for the Fragile Tour, all that could have been tour. Um, they opened for Nine Inch Nails and I had no idea that Maynard was doing it. I didn't know what a perfect circle was, right? I got a ticket, a perfect circle opening for Nine Inch Nails. What the fuck ever. A perfect circle starts playing and I'm like, fucking sounds like Maynard. Yeah. Fucking sounds like Maynard. It sounds like Maynard. And it wasn't until I got home and was able to Google it that I found out it actually was Maynard. <laughs> and I was like completely, wow, I just got to watch Maynard and Trent, which are two of my favorite, you know, on the same night. And I didn't even realize I was watching Maynard for that whole hour. That would have been a damn good show too. Yeah, it was great. And Aside from music, what's uh, what drives you? What's what inspires you? Uh, to be honest, it's more just music is sort of the the obvious creative expression, but I think just more generally creating is the big thing for me. Where, you know, I, I have plenty of sort of more varied interests in terms of, you know, I love uh, history and uh, reading about philosophy as much as the, the next guy who spends too much time in the basement. But it's one of those things where those are more just vaguely intellectual interests, whereas nothing gets me excited like the act of creating and music is more just where I've found some level of competency where I feel like I can do this and uh, what I what I do whether that's playing guitar or, or singing or anything like that uh, there might be varying levels of of how well I can do it, but I feel like there's something at the, you know, the uh, culmination of whatever talents I have musically that I can make something that I can listen back to and go, well, hey, uh, I would listen to it. And sort of out of necessity, more so than anything else, uh, working on music has sort of put me in a position where, all right, well, I can either try and find a, a photographer whose work I like in uh, in Muskoka, or I can just get a camera and, and take a shot at it. You know, I can either try and find someone whose, you know, work I like for videotography enough to, to hire them on and then try and explain some half-baked idea I have in my head, or I can just, try and figure out some way of all right i'm on a shoestring budget but i got myself a camera so let's figure out how to try and do a music video and i i've always sort of just trusted in the idea that you know what something well executed that that's great someone who really knows how to work a camera that's wonderful but if you don't have a halfway interesting idea, then uh, I don't care if you're an amazing photographer who can take a fantastic photo of that person in the sunlight, but, or sorry, the sunset, but I've seen that photo a hundred times and I don't find that all that compelling. But 
if I can pick up a camera and, you know, have some modestly artistic eye in terms of setting up a shot, uh, even if that does have technical issues, even if I, if I really knew what I was doing, I would know that, oh, that might not have been the best angle to take that shot from, or, oh, I probably should have moved that light forward five inches. But I sort of feel like, again, if you have a compelling enough idea, then that stands on its own. And so it's more been just trying to find different avenues to, to have some sort of creative expression that, again, you can leverage the inspiration, the idea from, even if you don't necessarily know what you're doing. You know, uh, when decide, all right, well, it sure would be cool to, to have a music video or two and going, well, I don't really, I, I went and got myself a camera, but I don't really feel like I can invest any money into this because I, I don't see any obvious return aside from just the gratification of, of doing it and feeling like, you know, I, I might actually be able to, to do this in a way that it's not embarrassing to look after or look at afterwards. So I think the first one that I, I did for the, uh, the first album I did was ordered off Amazon. One of those uh, uh, little rotating platters that they normally use for displaying jewelry and uh, got myself a, a macro lens and went, you know, and drawing sort of on stuff like the uh, the work that Rob Sheridan had done for Nine Inch Nails, where doing a lot of macro photography, I'm going, well, surely if I stick up some lights in a backdrop and I go around the house and I take the, you know, decorative seashell off the bathroom counter and I take the fake plant out of this room and I take the chain out of the workshop and I stick it all on this and I get some interesting shots then I can come up with something abstract that's kind of that, that sets a mood that is sort of accenting the song in a way that it complements it and you know walked away from that going well shit that turned out okay actually and you know and you show people who actually make music videos for a living and they're going so how did you do that because it's not obvious to me i'm going well i try <laughs> my secret i'm not telling you <laughs> <laughs> you know you're sure i embarrassed to tell them because <laughs> i promise it's not as interesting as you think but just the, the act of doing that of, of sort of having some sort of problem in the terms of like well, I've got no money for a music video, but I'd kind of like to do a music video. But I really don't want to do the walking down the side of a beach with acoustic guitar that you've seen a hundred times from a shitty grade nine multimedia class. Like, fucking kill me now if I have to watch that. Right. So how is you know how can I take this problem or in the same way you know well I need cover art for this, but. I don't know the first thing behind any sort of photo manipulate, you know, uh, photo software, anything like that. Photoshop. Well, I, I know how to open a new project. Uh, beyond that, not much. So coming from there, without becoming an expert in this, can I figure out how to make something on my own that even if it's not groundbreaking, even if it's not something that is... Uh, necessarily all that inspired can I do something that I feel creatively fulfilled and then I can look at and go you know what if I saw that album sitting on the record shelf I would probably pick it up and, and you know I, I know that's probably not the most efficient way of doing things because there's certainly you know in the same way of uh, when I'm working on music and Adam's usually the first person I'm showing for a second opinion I remember doing cover art and I'm going, well, yeah, that's an interesting, can you make that part a little brighter? And I go, well, I don't know how to do that. 
I'm not an expert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> writer. What yeah. Do you think I am? Well, it's, uh, you know, you kind of, you learn through the tools that you have available to you as well, right? I'm sure you've noticed that with songwriting as you got more and more gear, as you got like better guitars, better, you know, mics, better everything. It, it does open up new avenues for creativity, right? And, but being limited can also, right? Like the famous idea of like Beck doing an entire album on a Casio keyboard, right? Yeah. Like sometimes limiting yourself can inspire more than uh, having all of the tools of the trade. Uh, at, at your disposal and sometimes a lot of artists break through in that way right because they have had to rely on creativity as opposed to just you know tried tested you know uh, structures that work so you've mentioned insecurity a couple times and I think that uh, a lot of people when they think of us as musicians especially when they're just seeing us perform or they're just seeing the finished project project um like say the, the album or, or whatever it is, they kind of assume that we're probably a little bit more narcissistic than we are insecure. But uh, my Myris uh, experience with musician is actually kind of the opposite. I mean, I, I uh, relate a lot to hearing you say that because I, I know how it feels and just kind of being able to push yourself through that uh, becomes really important. So I was wondering if you could, uh, maybe if there's a younger guy out there, maybe struggling with that, what kind of helped you push yourself through it? Um, not acknowledging it, trying not to think of it, and uh, screaming into the pillow at night. Outside of that. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> You're on your own, buddy. That's what I would say to him. Uh, <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Well, uh, tell people where they can find you. Uh, so on all the music streaming services, it would just be Mark Doucette, same with YouTube and all that. And, uh, then also doing this metal side project that hopefully if all goes well, I'll have a new album of my own stuff out this year. And then hopefully an album of the metal stuff out. And that's under the artist title El Psy Congru, which is a butchered anime reference that i feel like uh that was originally thought up when this was just supposed to be a basement project that never sees the light of day and suddenly now that we're actually talking about trying to put together a, a full album and release it suddenly i'm going that might not be the best band name so we'll see if that sticks but <laughs> Nothing well, else. Definitely send me the links and I'll drop them in the description of this video. And um, yeah, I'll, 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 you know, shoot it over to you when it's done. You can share it with all your peeps. But thank you very much for doing this. Um, I, I've been wanting to kind of like, we've never actually met, despite the fact that we have some mutual friends. We've almost collaborated on a song together, which never ended up happening. But it's been a good way to get to know you a little bit, man. So thanks for doing it. Yeah, it was good talking to you. And I'm, hopefully you're able to get together with the boys at some point and get some more unraveling stuff put out Shane and I have been doing it yeah we've uh I don't know how many songs we've got done but I think we're planning on putting out an album next year we're gonna record it over this year um kind of taking a very different approach with this uh it's been a lot of fun but uh so far it, it's some of our best work so we're pretty excited to share it yeah I'm looking forward to that because I I was hoping i know he's been doing so much of the hip-hop production right now and the more he was doing that the more i'm going you know what with him branching into that i'm more eager to hear you guys put a record out to hear how that might inform the the music whether it's drawing elements of that or him going i need a break from this so we need to get as far away from it as possible. Either way, I think it would be interesting. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. Yeah, his instrumentals are great. And um, I'm taking a very different approach to vocals. Um, I've always taken it, like I said earlier, way too seriously. So on this one, I'm, I'm kind of doing the opposite. Uh, we've done a couple of sessions where I just go over there and get drunk and start singing and see what happens. Um, and we've, we've had some pretty awesome results of that. So looking forward to getting that done. And I'll, uh, of course, you will hear it once that's done. Yeah, and uh, I, I was just going to say, I know I've talked to him a couple times about having to make it down sometime to uh, come check out the studio that he's got set up now. And so we'll have to make that happen and uh, make an evening of it. 
yeah, man, let me know. Uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Sounds good. I'll let you go for now. We'll say goodbye to everybody at home. Yeah. Good talking to you, man. Cheers. Hey, guys. A little promo read here for a new sponsor here on the Miscellanea podcast. For the curious, merging the mystical into the mundane, the sacred wanderer knows it's a feeling. You are it architect of its kind, multifaceted human being, multidimensional, transitioning between worlds, a subtle portal through integration, a quest to ground a new paradigm. Inspired by you creations, creating curious minds. If you go to inspired by you creations, that is inspired by the letter U creations, all one word, dot com, and enter promo code CURIOUS20, you will receive $20 off all of the magical products on that page, such as this t-shirt I am wearing right now. A lot of very inspiring quotes um, on some great material. Uh, go check them out. I think you'll like it. Another shout out to Bow Chicka Wow Wow Records. Um, promo code MISC20, M-I-S-C-20 on the Bow Wow, Bow Chicka Wow Wow shop on Etsy will get you 25% off of the 20 Infinity t-shirt and all of their other products there. So thank you guys for supporting Miscellanea. Enjoy the rest of the podcast.